Today's video is sponsored by Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning platform that actually allows creators to present to you everything you need to develop a skill without being throttled by the algorithm. Now this is huge. So because of that, it's really valuable information where the creator is actually able to walk you through in depth what needs to be done. One of the recent courses I just did was on organic fertilizer and building a hoop house. It's done by Backyard Abundance and it's great for understanding hoop houses and kind of what needs to be done. I did this for both the winter gardening side and then hopefully pest management in the fall. It's definitely one that you as a gardener would likely want to check out. So with that being said, you should make 2022 the perfect year to create a new hobby, land a new career, or launch your business. For a limited time, you can receive 50% off a full year subscription of Skillshare. This is our best value offer for the entire year. This isn't like other black Friday sales you're seeing. It's not about more consumption, more stuff, more clutter. This is about you, your passion, curiosity, your spirited growth, and about something you're doing for yourself all year long. I will see you guys over on Skillshare and let's get on with the video. Today we're talking about electric culture. Now this is becoming more and more common. I keep on seeing like TikToks and stuff about it, which is kind of funny, but it's not new and it's kind of, it's tinfoil hat type conspiracy sort of thing, but it also works. So let's go through the entire history of electric culture, what science says about electric culture now in today's day and age, whether or not it works and whether or not you should set up electric culture at home. Let's get into it. So if you guys have not seen these TikToks, I encourage you to go find them. It's rods and copper and batteries and you name it, hooked up to people's houseplants, hooked up to people's gardens. And the theory here is that passing low levels of electricity through the soil and actually ambiently around the plant can help prevent against disease, help with nutrient uptake, you name it. So in order to understand electroculture, we have to understand exactly how it works. Now, there is a copper wire that's suspended around three meters above the plant, but this copper wire also is placed partially in the soil itself. And in China currently, there's something around-ish 9,000 acres that are under electric culture. And the plants that are under electric culture are inside of greenhouses. Take some of this information with a grain of salt. One thing I will say is they're inside greenhouses and the actual hoops on the greenhouses is what is wrapped in copper. And so that's how they're able to support this or do this, um, I guess, economically in a sense and one thing they will say is that pretty much 90% of all disease and pests are reduced or eliminated entirely both in the soil and ambiently now one thing I will say is if you're in a greenhouse it's a pretty controlled situation so pest wise it should be relatively low to begin with so I mean again take that with a grain of salt what I will say though is that there is a noted reduction in fertilizer up to 30% now we'll get into the reason for why this may be but it is a known fact that it decreases fertilizer uptake and they say that it's feasible but ultimately when we're talking about doing this on a mass scale of farming I don't see the feasibility there however in a greenhouse or a small garden setup or a house plant setup yeah sure fine it's it's feasible out of electricity it consumes is 15 kilowatt hours per day per hectare now they say that that is half the electricity usage of an Australian family in a day. So, I mean, keep that in mind. A hectare, while it sounds like a lot of land, is not a whole lot of land. It's a lot by, you know, the standard of urban agriculture, but on the scale of a farm, it's really not that much. So I could see the cost mounting uh, pretty darn quickly. However, uh, the World Economic Forum actually did a, a blog post on this so I'll link that in the description below if you want to go read it they do think it's the future they think it's the future of agriculture uh, that's gonna get people real worked up <laughs> that they are the ones that said this uh, but ultimately I I'm just gonna leave that little tidbit off to the side and you can do with that what you will but in all seriousness the science says that it works under three main mechanisms these are the three main mechanisms in which makes electroculture 
so darn useful. The high voltage kills off the disease, the pests, the fungi, you name it. When we're talking about this though, you have to keep in mind, it's a blanket kill. It's not uh, a GMO situation where we're applying glyphosate on a genetically modified crop, being able to withstand that. The electricity kills all fungi, all bacteria, all pests, beneficial or otherwise. So you do want to keep that in mind. It's a kill all, but I mean, ultimately it does reduce your pesticide usage completely. The reason why we think that this works is that the high voltage actually suppresses the surface tension of water droplets on the plant leaves and accelerates evaporation. And you're probably thinking, evaporation, how is that a good thing? Why would increasing the surface tension on the leaf and increasing evaporation from the leaf matter? And if you've watched any of my videos on VPD, the light bulb just went off. If we are moving more water through the plant leaf, we are ultimately taking more water up from the base through the roots. When the roots take up more water, they take up more nutrients. When they take up more nutrients, the plant itself grows more rapidly. When the plant grows more rapidly, it can photosynthesize more, which ultimately means you can harvest faster or you get better nutrient uptake just in general, which enhances flavor and blah, 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 blah. So you can see how it's kind of a trickle effect. If we're able to increase the rate in which water is lost from the leaf, in a controlled environment. We don't wanna to lose too much that we affect the turgor pressure of the plant, but if we lose enough that we're increasing nutrient uptake, we get, a, we get a happier plant, we get a better plant. The other thing that electroculture does do accelerates the transport of some naturally charged particles such as calcium ions and bicarbonate, which boosts the metabolism process of the plant, speeding up metabolic activity such as carbon dioxide absorption and photosynthesis. So if we combine the evaporation of water from the plant system with rapid metabolism, of specific compounds, chemical compounds, that are natural inside of the plant, which ultimately speeds up processes that help with photosynthesis and that sort of thing. You can quickly see how, you know, a plant that normally had a growing degree days of 90 could be, you know, cut down to 70, or how we can end up getting more fruit production or just quicker fruit production, which would allow us to produce more food on that single plot in which that plant is planted. So those are the three mechanisms that make this so valuable. You're probably thinking, where does this all start? Where did this all start? Who in their right mind decided electricity and plants? Those are the two things that need to be done in order to, you know, feed the world. It's with the French, of course it was the French. And I'm knocking the French because I am French, so I'm, I'm kind of allowed to. There was someone, a human, named, and I'm going to butcher this, Bernard Germain Etienne de la Vallée Cherlon, Comète de la Pesette. Uh, anyways, he decided to start experimenting with electricity. And in particular, I love this word, I have to find it, impregnated electric fluid is what he used to water his plants with. Impregnated electric fluid is, is wonderful, I love it. So essentially his idea was that the water was electrically charged and he was going to water the plants with it. So there's really funny drawings of this. It's like a guy with a hose with like electricity going into it. He's like watering this orchard. It's hilarious, but he noted some things when this happened. He noted that the plant itself uh, did better, ultimately, in all aspects. So after that, it kind of sat at the wayside and no one paid attention to it until 1902. In 1902, there was a physics professor, Salem Lemstorm, <laughs> and he realized that trees in particular that were grown under the Aurora Borealis tended to grow much larger, much quicker. And he chalked that up to potential electricity in the ambient air around the plant. Now we didn't get the same benefits in the, you know, 1902 observation of pest reduction and fertilizer uptake and that sort of thing. But he did note that this, the plant itself grew larger, faster. And he was comparing that to plants of similar species farther down south where the aurora borealis wasn't necessarily touching. Then it lay dormant again until between First World War and Second World War, when the British government decided to pick it up in a top secret experiment. So they actually did this in complete secrecy and people didn't find out that they were doing this until very recently when they actually released some sort of document saying that it was being done. 
But between World War One and World War Two, they were trying to figure out how they could feed the British population on the you know, limited landmass they had considering they're on an island. And one of the ways they thought it could be done is through electricity. Inside of it, they noted some things um, such as increases in yield and the speed in which the yield was obtained. Uh, however, World War II broke out and it lay dormant again until China literally pulled it out here not too long ago. So China has started doing this. They have just, they have you know, south of 9,000 hectares under this sort of a setup. But there's two things that they noted. The first one being that there's a 20 to 30% yield boost in vegetable crops, and that there's a 20% reduction in fertilizer, and there was a 70 to 100% reduction in pesticide consumption. Now I'm thinking that the 70% reduction um, on the lower end is because pesticide is an all encompassing term that also includes weeds. So they're likely still using pesticide control for um, herbivore pests, pests, which are weeds, um, which is where that decrease would come in, but ultimately at 100% reduced uh, bugs, essentially is what it comes down to. So it's kind of cool. Uh, if you choose to do this, there is a ton of information out there on how to do it. I'm not gonna tell you to do it because I don't want you to burn your house down. You could do it technically on a smaller scale, such as with like houseplants and sort of thing. But again, I don't want you to burn your house down, so I'm not gonna show you how. But I, it, it works, it works. Um, and there's you know science to prove that. It doesn't do much for the roots. It doesn't do anything in the soil. Uh, but what it does do is it ultimately affects that upper foliage, which affects you know the entire system and how that nutrient is uptaken and down. Yeah, so I thought this would be a fun video to do. I knew, I know this question is coming my direction eventually because it's it's hit TikTok, so it's gonna go viral. And some people have some crazy outdoor setups that I just think to myself, why? Why'd you do that? But anyways, the World Economic Forum, uh, you know, thumbs up it. The Chinese thumbs up it. I guess the rest of us are gonna have to follow suit soon now. <laughs> I'll talk to you next time, bye.